Hello, everyone. Welcome to our evening with the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals. My name is Jerry Bullard, and I'm the current chair of the appellate section of the State Bar of Texas. Tonight, the appellate section has teamed up with the State Bar's criminal justice section to host this wonderful event. In December, the appellate section co-hosted a similar webcast for the Texas Supreme Court, and it was such a tremendous success that we wanted to host a similar event for its sister court. So I'd like to thank the court, the State Bar, and the Office of Court Administration for making this event possible. I'd also like to give special thanks to the Honorable uh, Jason Boatwright, who spearheaded the effort to put this program together. Judge Boatwright is a former justice on the Fifth Court of Appeals, an appellate section council member, and a co-chair of the appellate section's bench bar liaison committee. Uh, events like this one are typical of what the appellate section and the criminal justice section provides for its members, along with a host of other services. So if you're not a member of either the appellate section or the criminal justice section and would like to learn more about the services that we provide, I'd encourage you to visit our respective websites and check us out. Links to our websites were included in the instructions that you received today from the State Bar regarding this event. The email that you received from the Bar also included the MCLE course number. To claim CLE credit for the event, you will need to self-report your attendance via your MyBar page on the State Bar website after the event. Now, tonight, the judges of the Court of the Criminal Appeals will take a few minutes to tell us about themselves. Following that, Justice Beth Watkins of the Fourth Court of Appeals, who is co-chair of the Appellate Section's Bench Bar Liaison Committee, will pose questions to the court. Those questions will be the ones that you sent to us when you signed up for this event. And then to close out the evening, you will hear from Dwight McDonald, who is the current chair of the criminal justice section. Now, I'm, now I have the honor of introducing the presiding judge of the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, Judge Sharon Keller. Judge Keller was first elected to the Court of Criminal Appeals in 1994. She was elected presiding judge in 2000 and is the first woman to have served on the court. In addition to being the presiding judge, Judge Keller is also the chair of the Texas Indigent Defense Commission, is vice chair of the Texas Judicial Council, and is on the board of the Council of State Government's Justice Center. And with that introduction, I yield the floor to Judge Keller. Judge. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here. And we're so grateful to the appellate section and the criminal justice section for putting this event together. We also especially want to thank Jason Boatwright whose idea I believe it was and who worked on the logistics and our judge, David Newell, who volunteered to be our liaison for the project. So we're supposed to say a few words about the court or about ourselves by way of introduction. And what I wanted, to, you've just heard about me. I've been on the court for 26 years. I've been presiding judge for 20. But what I want to say in light of what's been going on for the last year is how much the court has changed. It changed in so many ways. It's hard to know where to start paper everything, of course, but there was also no ability to look up briefs or trial records or even court of appeals opinions when I first got here without going two buildings down to uh, a room that had the records and looking up, sitting down and looking them up in paper. And to be fair, we were still an on paper in-person court until just about a year ago, when in the space of one week, we all started working remotely, including for oral argument. It took a little longer to work out the kinks, but we finally have a routine just in time to start trying to go back in person. On Monday, the judges met in person for our weekly conference for the first time in a year. I have really appreciated the ability to work remotely, but in some ways, it just doesn't work the way that meeting in person with your colleagues does. We're not requiring staff to come back, but I'm very glad that the judges are meeting in person again and I'm looking forward to the next year as we continue to go back in, in the ways that we want to go back and stay remote in the ways that we want to. So thank you, and that concludes my comments. So we were going to have seniority for people introducing. Oh, OK. I didn't know we were just supposed to jump in. <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm just, you know, I'm trying to keep it loose. so. Okay, uh, I'm old and um, I'm, I'm second in line. Uh, I'm Barbara Hervey. Um, I am from San Antonio. Uh, I'm in my 21st year on the court. I was elected in 2000. And prior to that, I spent 16 years in the Bear County District Attorney's Office in the appellate section. And I was in private practice for five years before that where we did everything but tax and bankruptcy. 
I drive, when we're live, I drive from San Antonio to Austin almost every day because in addition to my judicial role, I oversee the Fund 540 grant that educates judges of all levels, prosecutors, defense attorneys, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm also co-chair of the Judicial uh, Commission on Mental Health. So I've got lots of stuff to do. I personally do not like working from home because I'm already trying to get a new family, um, but I haven't been successful. I'm tired of looking at them. They're tired of looking at me, but uh, I do think working from home does um, allow you to do some things uh, easier, but it also creates a problem in that every issue, and we have some pretty big things we uh, worry about and discuss and have to deal with on our court, but there's like 55 million emails that float around and it gets really, really hard to keep up with all of that and to coordinate staff and all that. So those are my comments. Uh, I, I thank everybody for being here. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you and I will yield the floor to, well, I would yield the floor to Judge Richardson, but we're waiting for him. So- hey, Oh, he's coming. Oh, he's here now in the snow. He's so in the Bert, snow. <laughs> Bert, you're up. Bert. I'm well, up already? Yeah. Up. yeah. I need to run out to the car and get my uh, dash cam, whatever you call it, the mini cam. <laughs> like, okay, well, then we're going to just yield to I'm Kevin. In a snowstorm and, right now. And, and you're <laughs> out of there. Now, are you ready to roll? I need about one minute, but go ahead and roll and I'll jump right in. Okay. Can, yeah, we can come back. I'm not in the hot seat already, am I? Yeah, not always. <laughs> Yeah, we'll come back to you. We'll come back. <laughs> Judge Yeary, you want to go ahead? Sure. Uh, I'm, my name is Kevin Yeary. I haven't been on the court for nearly as long as uh, Judge Hervey or Judge Presiding Judge Keller, but uh, I sure have enjoyed my time there. Uh, you know, I'm not sure if everybody watching knows uh, these things about me, but I grew up in Laredo, Texas, on the border. Um, it's where my family, uh, much of it still resides. Uh, I went to St. Mary's undergrad and law school and was fortunate to uh, have the opportunity in, back in 1991 to serve uh, the court and one of her judges, Judge Bill White. I was his law clerk uh, that year, 1991 to 92. And so I think that makes me the only judge on the court today who uh, has previously worked for the court as a lawyer. Um, so uh, after I left the court, I was in private practice for about three years, and, uh, and then I embarked on a uh, about 20-year career as an appellate lawyer for the big DA's offices in Texas, starting off in Dallas, uh, moving over to Houston for a little while, and then ending up in San Antonio for about the, the, the great majority of my time as a DA. Uh, that's where uh, Judge Watkins and I got to know each other quite well and just adore her. And uh, so in 2014 is when, when I was elected to the court. That means I was reelected now in 2020. And that means I'm into my seventh year, although not completed my seventh year on the court. That'll be a little while. Um, I served the, the court as uh, its a liaison in a couple of capacities, one of which is a liaison to the Judicial Committee on Information Technology. And also uh, this year, uh, as the state bar board liaison. So uh, I'm just really honored to work here. Um, it's great work and we have great people that we work with, which really is the part that makes it easy. Uh, Presiding Judge Keller guides a good ship and uh, that's pretty much it. <laughs> Bert, you're up now. I hope you have your camera ready. <laughs> we can circle back at the end. Circle back. There he is. <laughs> Perfect, perfect. Well, Judge Newell, are we at you? Go ahead, David. Yes, unless Bert wants to go. No, uh, go, David. Okay. Um, I still need another minute. I'm okay. Uh, I am, uh, my name is David Newell. I was elected in uh, 2015. Uh, I, I grew up in, in uh, Sugar Land. I was born in the Bethesda Naval Hospital because my dad was a, a not only a Navy, Navy Academy graduate, but also served in the Navy. And so, that's where he was stationed when I was when I was born in uh, in in, uh, in that area. And but I moved to got to got to Texas as quick as I could, and you know was grew up in in 
Fort Bend. And in fact, if you're from the Sugarland, the Fort Bend area, maybe you saw I did a lot of musical theater. I was really, really, very known for being Elvis in Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. It, it got rave reviews from my mom. So, uh, <laughs> so it was really good. And uh, I am also known as the, I'm the only person I believe that was on the court that has actually sang from the bench as well, uh, which means, I mean, you know, just to, to see things out. But I was a, I was a misdemeanor prosecutor in Fort Bend. Uh, I was lucky to do that, uh, to have that job. I started as a line prosecutor, worked my, but I was always doing appeals because I have a writing background. And then I went to work for the Harris County DA's office after that. So I had about 17 years experience before I ran for the court in 2015. And I'm just starting my second term, uh, uh, having just been recently reelected in the in the middle of the, the COVID, <laughs> COVID uh, crisis and, and a very tumultuous election year. Um, so it's nice to, to, be, uh, to be back. It's nice to continue on my work at the court. I'm very, very happy uh, with the work that I've been doing. Uh, it's been, a, it's been a, a definite experience. I will say that I, I was actually, I would never actually apply to be a lawyer on the court because I was afraid that I was not, that I couldn't get it. So I say that to people to say, don't be afraid because they're literally, there are openings right now. <laughs> so, so don't, you know, make sure that you, make sure that you do uh, just to take the chance, you know, and, and, and all that kind of stuff. Because look, I mean, I didn't think I was qualified to do it. And look, here I am now. I get a chance to work with all these folks and I get to be part of this great conversation of the court for, for over 125 years. So with that, I'll give it to Ms. the snowman, I guess, unless you're not, and, you know, unless you're ready, unless you want to pass off to someone else. I'm good to go. What am I supposed to do? Introduce myself, Beth? Please. That's about that, it. Yeah. That is not Colorado where I was skiing last week. That's the entrance to my subdivision. Um, I am Burt Richardson. I have been on the court since 2014 with uh, Judge Yuri and Judge Newell. I've been a judge since 1999. Uh, I practiced. Uh, I was a judge in front of Beth for several years. And it's good to be here tonight. Um, I went to St. Mary's Law School. I, I don't know where to tell you where I'm from because I've lived in too many places. Um, Europe for eight years, South America for two years, and lots of states. Um, my dad was in the military like David's dad was. Um, uh, after I graduated from St. Mary's, I worked at the DA's office and the U.S. Attorney's office in San Antonio, and somebody talked me into applying for a vacant bench in Bear County, and I was appointed by Governor Bush. And I was there until 2008. And then I became a visiting judge for six years and worked all over the state. Right, Beth? That is true. I think our paths crossed in Del Rio, at least for a train wreck, literally. <laughs> um, and I've, uh, I've taught at St. Mary's. Uh, most people know that I'm a pretty avid photographer. If I could make a living at it, that's what I would be doing. Um, but for now, it's uh, kind of the, the thing I like to do the most on the side. I, I really do enjoy teaching when I have the opportunity to do that. Um, it has really been an honor being on the court. I, I love research and writing, um, and I enjoy working with all of my colleagues. Uh, it's nothing like I ever thought it would be, to be honest with you, in, in, in a good way. Um, it's very different than being on a trial bench, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have tonight. Thanks for having us. And uh, my name is Mary Lou Keel, and I've been on the court since 2017. I was elected in 2016. I'm originally from Austin, but uh, moved to Houston to go to the University of Houston Law Center and then became a briefing attorney at the first Court of Appeals. And I went to the DA's office and then I served for 22 years on the district court bench in Harris County. And uh, I'm delighted to be on the Court of Criminal Appeals. It's uh, something that I wanted to do for a long time and the timing was right in 2016 and I got lucky enough to get elected. Um, I never did sing from the bench, unlike Judge Newell. Um, I would not inflict that on anybody because that might be considered cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, but uh, I do enjoy singing, I just don't do it in public. And uh, I'm happy to be back in Austin. I love this job, I love the people I work with and um, I'm delighted to be here tonight. Thank you for having me. Very good. Thank you, Judge Keel. And Judge Walker, are we to you now? Yes, and I am Scott Walker. 
I was elected at the same time Judge Kill was elected. So I've been on this bench since uh, two, 2017, January 1st. Um, and I probably am on, the only judge on this court that went to law school late in life. I was actually 44 years old when I became a lawyer and I've now been a lawyer for 23 years. So hopefully you won't add that up and figure out how old I am. But anyway, uh, prior to going to law school, I owned my own businesses. I, I built houses some, primarily I built swimming pools. Uh, I did that for probably 25 years prior to going to law school. So I started doing that when I was really very young. And um, anyway, uh, I think I'm also the only judge on this court that has uh, been on the defense side of the bar uh, mm -hmm. for my entire career as a lawyer prior, <laughs> prior to being on this court. I know that some of you have been on the defense side, but not exclusively. Uh, that's where I've been. I've I've tried a lot of felony cases, misdemeanor cases, did a lot of appeals prior, prior to running for this office. Um, I really enjoyed being a defense attorney. I had a, had a great time. I love going to trial. I always said that I'm one of the lawyers that is crazy, crazy enough to really enjoy being in trial because most of the lawyers that I knew did not want to go to trial any more than they had to, but I actually enjoyed it. But guess what? I enjoy this a whole lot more. I really thought that I would really miss being, you know, a criminal trial lawyer when I took this job, but now this is the greatest job in the world. I work with some of the greatest people in the world and I'm super honored to serve with the rest of the judges on this court. And I will give the floor to Judge McClure. Thanks, Scott. All right. So um, I'm Jesse McClure. And um, as some might say, I was not elected. I was selected. So I was appointed by the governor. The announcement was on December, I think it was 21st. And then I, I took office January 1st. Um, the joke that I kind of tell people is that 16 months ago, I was just a random prosecutor who worked for a very obscure state agency um, in Houston. Um, and now here I am on the court. So previous to this, I was the judge of the 339th District Court in Houston. Um, and I'd been appointed to that after telling everyone that I was never going to be, I was never going to seek appointment to a bench in that manner, but I was talked into it. And now I'm glad I, I was. Um, most of my career, I was a prosecutor in two places. I was a prosecutor in, in uh, Tarrant County from 2000 to 2011. And then I was a prosecutor with the Department of Insurance, but I was stationed at the Harris County District Attorney's Office from 2012 to 2019. Um, yeah, I've loved this job. And, and I'd, I, was worried, I was worried that I would miss it. I was worried that I would miss sort of the social aspect because in my head, I always thought appellate law meant you just sit in your office all day by yourself and um that is not true and in some ways it's more it's more social being an appellate judge than it is being a trial court judge because in a trial court you sit on the bench all day and people just ask you for stuff and it's not really a conversation it's more of a mother may i situation whereas i have eight people to talk to plus the staff and so um you know i'll look at what judge walker said i mean this job is the coolest job i've had since I was 16 years old and got paid a bunch of money to stock shelves at a grocery store, but that job's not coming back. So um, anyway, I'm just happy to be here. Um, I'm from everywhere. So I, I moved to Texas in 96 to go to law school and vowed that I would stay in Texas just long enough to get a law degree and then go back to some fun place like California or Washington, D.C. But I met an Aggie in law school and she is now my wife. So um, and I like to joke also as well that I'm the only the second best appellate lawyer in my house because my wife won best brief her first year at UT law school. And I most certainly did not, but anyway, good thing that, uh, good thing nobody's, nobody went back at the governor's office to read my brief from my first year. Um, again, thank you so much tonight. And I'm, I'm like, um, Bert said, I, you know, I look forward to your questions.
Very good. Well, my name's Beth Watkins. I have the privilege of sitting on the Fourth Court of Appeals and also serving on the State Bar of Texas Appellate Section's uh, Bench Bar Committee, which I chair along with uh, the Honorable Jason Boatwright, who did the heavy lifting of putting this event together today. So uh, on behalf of, of myself and Jason and all the members of the Appellate Section and the Criminal Justice Section who came together to put this event on, we thank you for your participation tonight. And Judge McClure, if it's okay, I might start with you and ask just, a, I mean, what has it been like starting this position in the middle of a pandemic? I mean, the good news is I don't know any better because obviously I started in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, so I was on the trial court bench um, starting in November of 2019. And so I kind of got to be a trial court judge during normal times until March. And so um, once, you know, we started shutting things down, you know, I, I, one thing that's good, I think, from where I am now is that I can see how trial courts handle Zoom hearings and um, things like that. It, I, I'm glad that I started I mean, I'm glad, I'm, in a way, I'm glad that I don't know any better because, um, you know, I was going to have to learn something brand new anyway. So I'm glad I've learned, you know, looking up, you know, Judge Keller mentioned looking up records and, and you know, so learning the computer system. And because if I had started with all paper and then gone to this, I don't, I'd still be, I mean, not that I've mastered it, but I definitely would be struggling a lot more if I'd started under the old system and then uh, went this way. So. Very good. Well, thank you. So Judge Keller, I might just throw out some questions um, and maybe the first one to you. And then from here on out, if there's any questions you think would be more appropriately um, asked of your colleagues, then, then I will rely on your judgment to help get the right question to the right person. But let's, let's start out a little bit by talking about the court's operations during the pandemic. I mean, how we're, we're almost a year into this. How has the pandemic affected the court's day-to-day -day operations? And, and what's it like? How is your experience different working at the court during the pandemic? It works very well, I would say. And our staff, we have a large central staff and virtually all of their work can be done remotely and they have just taken to it very well and they're doing a great job. Um, what we're missing just like anybody else that's working remotely is the daily interaction with your colleagues. And I've always thought that was so important to be able to go down the hall and talk to Judge Hervey or whoever, go to lunch together and talk about, just kind of in a casual atmosphere, talk out legal issues. And you, that doesn't work when you're working remotely. I've noticed during oral argument and in conference too on Zoom, I'm, now, my colleagues might not believe this, but I actually don't talk as much as I usually, usually do because you have to uh, kind of defer to other people without really knowing who wants to talk and who doesn't. It's, it's very different. So I'm really happy that we're, oh, I'm so sorry. See, I don't know how to do things like that. Um, I'm really happy that we're starting to go back. Um, as far as how the court works, it, it works the same as it did before, but I don't think it's quite as efficient as we are when we're in person. When we met on Monday, I thought we had a great conference, got a lot of work done, and um, I'm really glad to be back with my friends again in person. Judge Newell. I wanted to add something to like, because what you're saying, and I, I do want to add about, one of the things I found interesting is Judge Kelly's done a really, really good job of sort of leading us through all this stuff with Zoom meetings and, and going remote and switch the room. And she's done a great job. The thing that ended up, that actually ended up being more difficult was the ransomware attack. Like in the middle of it, the ransomware attack that kept us from our access to all these different things was actually much more of a challenge than our ability to go online. But she's actually right. We're, as, and as Judge McClure alluded to earlier, it's like it's, it's a much more social kind of thing than you would think a pellet would be, but it's kind of demented and sad, but social. <laughs> but, but, you know, but basically, we do miss talking to each other, and interacting, and we did. And she's exactly right. I mean, she's a very, you know, it's a very, it's a very good uh, give and take kind of thing when you can meet in person. So that's something we definitely miss. I, I certainly I miss. So very good. Anyone else want to share their pandemic experiences of working with the court? Oh, I, I, I just thought it was kind of nice on Monday when we had our first conference in almost a year that I could walk downstairs 
um, walk through the clerk's office and there were a few of them working there. I was like, hey, there's a real person here. You know, it's somebody you can talk to face to face rather than, I mean, I've, I've literally been, I say literally, I, my wife and I joke that we have been locked up together for almost two years between the campaign and the pandemic between our car or house um, with nowhere to go. And it, you do miss that social interaction. And, and I think it, it goes a long way when you're talking about cases in conference and just occasionally seeing the staff that you never see anymore. You know, you bring up the, the cases in conference and I'm curious if anyone has noticed any trends any you know kinds of the, the types of cases or the types of issues that have made their way to the court in the last year as as we've gone through this. Bueller, <laughs> Bueller. Well, I'll jump in. No, fine. Whatever. <laughs> One other thing that you think that we, opinion today. <laughs> well, we had a no. I, I think that what you're. I do think that what you're seeing is that we had an opinion today dealing with the emergency order. So there's a lot of the debate about emergency orders. We had one that, that Sharon authored that, uh, uh, that, that we had dealing with, with that and how it suspends procedures. And then even though we don't actually say it, we actually had another opinion that Judge Herbie uh, authored on a confrontation clause with, with a Zoom or a, a Skype hearing type hearing. And it's like, even though it wasn't a pandemic case, you can kind of feel that overarching in the background as a shadow in the background. So, so, I mean, those are the kinds of things I think we have seen in, in, in uh, the, the, the pandemic. I mean, absolutely. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's part of our lives. It's like, we keep saying like we're working from home, but actually we're living at work. That's, that's the, it's more like that. And, and so maybe that's the reason we're so desperate to get outside, please let us come to work. But, you know, but that's the, that's the kind of trend that, that I, the trends I think you see is that the very things you would think, which is how is it that the rights are going to be uh, protected, uh, through defendants protected or uh, in these situations where you're having to change your procedures to fit this electronic give and take. Also, we get a lot of people asking for extensions of time because of COVID. So uh, that has been a, a major issue with us. Very good. I am curious, you know, a number of, we've, we've, we got a number of questions in from practitioners about remote oral argument. Has the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals adopted any kind of remote argument protocols? I know that the US Supreme Court has adopted some procedures that give the ad advocates two minutes to open without questions and then allow questions in order of seniority uh, per justice. So has your court considered any accommodations for remote argument or have you seen the need? I would say, I haven't seen the need. We treat remote oral argument as if we were in the courtroom. The only difference that I can see is that it's it's harder to ask questions when you can't look and see that the judge next to you is ready to talk or the judge down the way. And so sometimes it's hard to get questions asked. Uh, and in fact, I ask a lot fewer questions in oral argument remotely. But um, other than that, we don't, we do it just the way we do in person as far as I can remember. Anybody else? Yeah, we do I, have, oh, I, I'm I, sorry, I, go ahead. Yeah, and this, this is an example of why it's harder to ask questions on Zoom than in person because there's just kind of a little artificial lag. You, you're talking over each other, but you're not really talking over each other. And so the interruption just didn't natural and didn't flow and you can't really tell who went first. So it is a little bit, you know, artificial. I don't like that artificiality. But um, overall, I think it's gone really well doing the remote argument. And um, it's, you know, it's, it's, an, it's an okay substitute. I'd rather do it in person, but it, it, it suffices under the circumstances as far as I'm concerned. Kevin? I was just gonna point out that uh, uh, one thing that, that was a good addition, I think, to our oral argument uh, program since we're doing it on Zoom is these cool backgrounds. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed, but while Judge Keel was speaking, I switched my background to the, the courtroom. This is actually a photograph of our courtroom. So uh, the lawyers who come to see us actually see the courtroom that they would have seen if they would have been able to come to see us in person. 
And, uh, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, we also make available to lawyers who come to argue before the court uh, a similar sort of reverse picture of the courtroom so that we, when we see them, if they use that background, which I don't think we force them to, there are sometimes when I've seen them without it, um, we can see them at the podium essentially or with the podium there, so. We haven't actually had any people that were kittens trying to represent uh, on the, on the court. <laughs> Yeah, no that's apparently a problem. That's a real thing. Fake, bear, fake lawyers, kittens pretending to be fake lawyers. So we haven't had any of those kinds of things. I would, I would add though, one of the things about it, it was really fortunate the legislature did give us money to sort of start taping and broadcasting these things. And so it was quite an, it was, it, we would have been lost if we hadn't had that when this happened, because we were able to take advantage of the cameras and things like that to do it. But we, we, I think it's worked pretty well. I mean, it, 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 you're, it is true. You find yourself sort of jockeying for position, do you, you know, like you raise your hand or something like that. Um, and, but that's, you know, the interesting thing about that though, is that that's the thing when I got on the court that I found in, or was strange was that when I was doing oral argument as an advocate, I didn't realize what it must be like for the judges. Like there are plenty of times I've been in oral argument and I'm like, they didn't, I didn't get to ask my question because so many other people are asking the question. And so I'm not getting the answers to those kinds of things. And that's kind of a little bit more also a little bit of the kind of thing you see in the Zoom stuff. If you can't get your question out, you're really feeling frustrated that you, you didn't get an answer to your question. So. Oh, I find it hard to believe you didn't get a question out. <laughs> well, I try, especially, uh, you know, I try to do that very, very, very much. But, uh, you know, what I like is the fact that I will ask a question and then someone will ask it at the end of the oral argument, like I never even asked it. So, <laughs> so you know, I'm definitely making sure that I get the, the answer that I want. You have to ask it right, David. That's I the know, I do. I absolutely do. I should sing it. Sing it. There you go. That's right. I would like to add one thing to this conversation. Actually, working on Zoom has really helped keep me in line. Because when we're in person, being a, a lawyer that spent a lot of time in trial, I tend to want to cross-examine the lawyers rather than ask them questions. And when you're on Zoom, it just doesn't work very good. So I tend to ask, actually ask questions rather than try to tell the lawyers what I think. <laughs> Very good. So I have another question about remote or argument. You know, you presiding Judge Keller, you talked about how it's it's hard sometimes to get your questions out because of the lag and and you know just because of not knowing where your colleagues are in terms of preparing to ask a question. So I'm curious if you have any you know any um, observations about mistakes that you have seen advocates make or any suggestions for what they can do, steps they can take to make it easier for the court to jump in and ask questions. Oh, oh you're muted. There we go. Um, I, I think the advocates do a great job. And I, I don't, I haven't seen any of them that are uncomfortable um, holding oral argument remotely. And I think uh, they might like it better than holding oral argument in person we may have to figure out a way to accommodate the, the artificiality that Mary Lou was talking about. But you know, this is also new to me, even after a year. I'm just glad when I can be there in person, I mean, on the camera when I'm supposed to. We're, we're all learning. Very good. Who else has some suggestions for the advocates that are tuning in today about what they can do to really have a better conversation with the court during their remote oral arguments? Well, really, I think that it's not that much different than if they were arguing in person. And um, the ones that do the best job are the ones that are the best prepared. And that's true whether they're in person or remote. And overall, I think they've really done a good job of dealing with the technology and um, adapting to it and, and just presenting their best case that they can under the circumstances. And I don't think that the technology has really held them back at all. Very good. Thank you. Thank you all for that. So 
Show of hands, when the pandemic is over, who wants to continue remote oral arguments? Mm -hmm. Everybody wants to go back. So nobody thinks that remote <laughs> arguments are here to stay. Good, well, back in person, should. it will be. Yes, Judge. I think we might want to allow in certain circumstances, but in general, I would say no. Very good. So kind of yeah. a, I was just going to say it's kind of an interesting thing to consider, you know, whether at some point in time we're, we're going to have other advances in technology where we might be able to have holograms appear in the courtroom. <laughs> <laughs> like Tupac. <laughs> like Tupac and Piggy Smalls. I mean, absolutely. That's, that's what's been missing from oral argument this whole time. <laughs> But I do think that that will still <laughs> leave something to be desired. There, there is something about inhuman contact and being in someone's presence that uh, helps the helps people relate to one another and understand each other. I'm not sure exactly what that is. It's a little bit intangible, but uh, uh, certainly it's something to to uh, not discount at all. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Justice Watkins. No, no. I'm I'm grateful for the insight that you're sharing. So. <laughs> Thank you for that. One last question about remote oral arguments, and then we will move on to the ethics portion of this evening's program. Um, what goes through each of your minds or anybody who has any ideas that they want to share, what goes through your mind when deciding whether to ask a question at oral argument? And then I'm curious how that math has changed remotely. Well, my primary consideration is not to ask a dumb question. <laughs> I don't always achieve that goal. I, I often do not achieve that goal, but that's my prime consideration. And it's the same whether we're in person or on Zoom. I'll also add in here that uh, I, I really ask questions that I actually have. You know, I, I, don't, I don't generally try to invent questions before I get to conference, but... I study the case really well, as well as I can, given the, the time that I have available to do it. And when I get to the, to the courtroom, if I still have questions, those are the questions that I'm going to be asking, you know, and, uh, and I find it really helpful to have the lawyers themselves who I can ask those questions to. So, um, you know, they're going to be, they're going to know their case way better than me. They're going to know their case way better than probably any of the other judges that, you know, we've got great judges here who study the cases very well before we get there, but, uh, but you're going to know your own case, you know, better than anybody else will. And so um, I just, that's what I do. I, I, I ask questions that I really want to know the answer to. Um, I don't just ask them to ask them. Very good. Thank you. Thank you all for that. So you know, we live in this increasingly polarized world and we, we, you know, see different kind of invective on the daily news. I'm wondering if the court has noticed any kind of changes in behavior from the lawyers or the parties in recent years. Let's see, maybe Judge Hervey, Judge Keller, you, you two are our senior judges here. I'm curious if you have any ideas that you want to share on that topic. I haven't seen any, anything like that. Um, fortunately. How about you, Barbara? No, I haven't seen any change. If people are ugly, they were ugly before. <laughs> and if they're great, they're great now. So you know, that's, a, yeah. Uh, very good. Very agreed. good. Um, so talking about practical advice for the, the lawyers, for the litigants who appear in front of your court, what are some of the things that you wish that they would do and consider more before filing a petition? Well, I, I would joke when I was on the trial bench, I would joke sometimes that, you know, someone would bring an issue to my attention. And I'd say, Oh man, I guess we're gonna have to read the law today. And, you know, it sounds very basic, but you know, sometimes people don't read the law and sometimes, you know, sometimes the best way to find out what the law is to actually read it. So, um, it, you may have read it a hundred times or a thousand times or 10 times, but it never hurts to start at the very beginning with the basics because you might find something you missed last time and, and it might be something very crucial. Great advice, Judge McClure. Anyone else? What other things do you wish that lawyers and litigants would consider before 
before they hit send on that e-filed brief? I, I think I think we we still see, I wouldn't say as much as um, I observed when I first got to the court, but we still see people that are incapable of figuring out what is the best point to be making. So, um, you know, you really need to, to figure that out. Uh, we see it in briefs and of course it follows through an argument. Put your best foot forward, your best argument forward and know the court, know which judge, you know, thinks uh, X in a particular area. Um, that's really important because if, if you're taking an opposite position, you can be sure that judge is going to have at least some questions for you. If not, I don't know, some kind of Scott um, cross-examination. <laughs> <laughs> judge Newell, please. I, I, I was going to say, what's well, sort of building off of what Judge Herbie said, she's right. You should know the court, but more than that, you should also kind of know your audience in the court. It's not just the individual judges. Like our perspective is going to be different than the perspective of the Court of Appeals. You have to be aware of the kinds of things we're looking at. We're looking for conflicts among court, among courts of appeals. We're not looking to sort of, we're not generally looking for sort of error correction. We, it does, we do do that, but for the most part, we're looking for something that is going to affect uh, the, something that the court of appeals didn't consider. We want to look at the decision of the court of appeals and we want to see what, how that fits into a larger scheme of law. And so our, our perspective on these, these petitions is just is different than what your regular brief would be. And so that's the kind of thing you want to know. You want to know what your audience is so you can better package what your, your claim is. So that's the thing I would say. This sounds kind of basic, but how you frame your issues is really important. And good editing is really important. Um, <laughs> if, if you want to get your point across, make it easy for the judges to understand. And just, I know it means knowing your case inside out, but just remember, we get lots and lots of PDRs and lots of writs. And if you want, if you want us to pay attention to yours, you need to make your point while you have the chance instead of you know, having lots of points of error or lots of grounds for review and um, focus. Very one, thing, good. one thing I would like to bring up that I think is very important, and I think people make mistakes in this area a lot, is not really carefully looking at the record. I can think of two opinions that I've authored in the last three years that when I decided to look at the record really carefully after reading the briefs and the Court of Appeals opinion, I started seeing things that nobody had talked about. And sometimes a picture's worth a thousand words. I, there's been cases where a photograph that nobody even really talked about can make the difference in the case. Or, you know, things that's, you know, embedded in a firearms examinator, examiner's report, something like that. Uh, Pay attention to the record, read it carefully. Uh, don't just skim it. Hey, Very Beth, good. can I drop one little nugget out there also? This is Please just a really do. a comment. And that is that uh, there's been a change, I think, in my perspective about a lot of things since I started uh, working on the court. Because I, I practiced for quite a long time as a lawyer filing briefs. And I oftentimes wondered, you know, why was I spending so much time making a table of contents? And why was I making, uh, spending so much time listing a table of authorities? And why do I have to write, you know, yet another summary of the argument? I've already written the argument. But all of those things, as far as, uh, you know, speaking for myself, those are all great tools for me when I'm, when I'm working through a case. And I, I, I don't want to go read the whole brief again just to find a, a particular site to one of the opinions uh, that's, that I know is cited in there and is relied upon, I can go to the table of authorities. And there it is, you know, it's listed right there. So I can find the site, can walk over to my library and pick up, pick up the book and sit down and read it, you know? So uh, I guess what I'm saying is, is from the practitioner's perspective, sometimes those things feel 
like a burden, but you're really, by doing them well, you're putting us in a better position to be able to more easily access the arguments that you're making, the cases that you're citing, and so forth. And so I just wanted to, to mention that, that little observation. Quick follow-up question on that point. Um, and, you know, Jajiri, you talk about the, the table of contents and the summary of the argument. Judge Keller, you talk about needing to make your point right up front. I'm curious where each of you start when you're reading a new brief. What, what section do you flip to? Judge Keller, do you mind if we, if we start with you? Um, when I'm reading a PDR, I read the grounds for review, and then I go straight to the Court of Appeals opinion, and then I read the rest of the PDR. Because it, the allegations in the PDR might not match with what happened in the Court of Appeals, and I don't want to wait till I get to the end to find that out. So that's typically what I do. When I'm reading a brief, it's just I pretty much skip all the things that Kevin was talking about and go straight through the, the uh, text part of it. Very good. Judge Harvey, same question for you, if you don't mind. I actually um, look at the look at what's raised. Look, and um, I don't care if the case was published. I don't care what the vote was on it. I don't care where it came from. It's you know what issues are they bringing forward, and um, from there I will uh, like Judge Keller. I will read the opinion and uh, go through the rest of it. But it really makes a difference to me because um, when I was in the appellate section and Kevin and Bert were in there also, so from our land, uh, honing those skills on framing those issues was a big deal. So uh, that's what I start with. Judge Harvey, or excuse me, Judge Richardson, any observations on this point from you? Where do you start in a um, petition? I, th I think one of the best kept secrets about our court is the central staff. And I, I don't know if they have a central staff like in other appellate courts across the state. I, I kind of refer to them as kind of the crown jewel of our court. They are really some of the finest lawyers in the state. And almost every PDR we get gets worked up by a member of that staff. Uh, they, they summarize the cases very succinctly. Uh, they make recommendations to us, although we don't have to follow them. And to me, that's a very good starting point. It helps me understand what the legal issues are uh, from both sides. And they do a very good job of that, what their recommendation might be. And then from there, I usually go to the appellate court opinion. Um, I'm, I'm always curious, having worked across the state to see where it came from, who are the justices involved in that, and what their decision was. Uh, that summary will normally tell me some of that, but not all of that. And it, and it gives me a, a good, um, good idea of what the legal issues are that we are dealing with and the different parties' views of, of why they should prevail. Very good. Thank you. Jajiri, do you have any observations on this point? Where do you start in a petition? Well, I'm going to almost always start with the grounds of review. And, and, and I, I was kind of chuckling to myself when Judge Keller mentioned going to the opinion of the Court of Appeals that we're reviewing, because that was a, a tip that was given to me by uh, former Judge Cheryl Johnson, because uh, there were times when I would be struggling over the arguments made in a brief for a long time. And she said, you know, if, if you can't figure out whether you want to grant review from the argument, just go, just drop it and go straight to the Court of Appeals opinion. She said, you've been doing this long enough that when you read an opinion and you think it's right, you know it. And if you think it's wrong and it needs to be corrected, you'll know that as well. So I do go to the Court of Appeals opinion. Uh, it's, it's still not the first thing that I do. I, go, I look at the grounds of review. That kind of tells me, it gives me a sort of a framework for you know, what, what, I, what lens I need to be looking through when I'm reading the argument. But then I go to the argument and I start reading there. Uh, the, the, when I mentioned earlier the summary of the argument being so important and the, the table of contents and the table of authorities, those are easy access points that I come back to after I've read the argument in the brief. So I start with the grounds of review. I go to the argument. If I'm lost in the argument, I go to the Court of Appeals opinion. And when I'm really working on the case, I start using those other tools that the lawyers have provided for the court that I described earlier. 
Excellent. Good advice for practitioners. Judge Newell, same question for you. Yeah, I, I, I'm a bit of a maverick. I start with a certificate of service. Um, <laughs> I want to make sure that everyone, no, that's not true. That's not true. I'm really very similar to what everyone else says. It, it, it is good. I always look for the issue. You're framing the right issue. Spotting the issue is one of the most important things. But you know what I do like, and I, I used to take some care to do this. I'll, I'll do the issues. I'll go read the opinion. But the next thing I do is I want to make sure that I get the facts. One of the, you know, I come from a little bit more of a creative writing background. So I like getting the sense of how this legal issue is playing out in the case so that you can, you get, you don't get too focused on a real uh, uh, hypothetical legal argument without understanding the, the real cost of the case. And, and that can be very helpful as well. But I mean, yeah, the thing that, I'm, that I've found and is true is that all those different parts, you think of putting this whole document together like it's going to be read straight through, but it's really designed so that you can go in and out of the document and consume it in different pieces as you go find other things. And that makes it very easy. The, the way that it's organized does make it very easy to sort of get a lot of different information relatively quickly. Good advice. Good advice. Judge Walker, where do you start in a petition? Well, I agree with what almost everybody said about where we actually start. W one thing that I want to add to that is, you know, after looking at the, the issues, the points, uh, a little bit of the law, after that, I like to look at the briefs, um, the PDR, look at the arguments of, of one lawyer and look at the arguments of the other. And what I'm usually looking for is the fact that they're going to characterize the facts a little differently, and that's normal, and I expect it. But if there's anything that's drastic, then I immediately want to go to the record and seeing who's being honest and who's not being honest. And that kind of gets to a whole different issue here and has to do with with being candid with the court. Sometimes we actually read facts and then you look at the record and look it up and look at the photographs and it's just not what we're seeing. So that's something that's important to me and it should be important to litigants. Very good. Judge Keel, my apologies. Did I just skip you on this question? Oh, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Really, I don't think I have a particular pattern. It just kind of depends on the case and the issue and how it strikes me. I don't start necessarily with one thing or another all the time. Very good. Thank you. And Judge McClure, saving the best for last. Yeah. Where have you, where do you find that you start in petition? I, you know, I probably retreat to old law school training when it's 45 minutes before class where I I start reading your, I start reading the headings just so I can get a flavor for what the case is about. And then I'll start digging, but I, I want to know, you know, I just kind of want to know where we're going before. And that might be the impatient trial judge in me. Cause what I would do when I was on the trial court bench is if I, if, if you opened your mouth and it sounded like it was going to take you five minutes to explain something, I would just hold up my hand, stop you and say, what is it you want? And why are you entitled to it? And does the other side agree? And so um, I really want to know the cliff notes version and then I'll start digging after that. So the, the headings, you know, the grounds for review and then any, any bold headings in your, in your brief, your, your PDRs, your briefs, that's what I'm looking at first and then I'll start digging later. Excellent. Great advice all around for practitioners. So thank you for that. I have some questions. You know, we talked at the very outset about your conferences. I have some questions about how your conferences work. Are, are only the nine judges present or do your attorneys attend as well? Who presents the PDR? What does that process look like? David? Well, <laughs> Sharon. Yeah. Um, the judges, only the judges are present for opinion, for opinion discussion. The staff comes in when we discuss whether to grant or refuse PDRs and whether to, you know, disposition for the writs that come to conference. But yeah, I think we, I think it's good to have no one in there except ourselves for an opinion conference. It means the judge has to know his case inside out and can't rely on staff to say, oh yeah, tell us about that. You have to know it. You have to be able to answer questions from your colleagues. And I think it works real well for us. 
Anyone else have anything they'd like to share about y'all's conference process? It works better when uh, someone brings food. <laughs> <laughs> Noted, no, as with so many things. Um, we, we received a couple more questions about PDRs and obviously thousands of them are filed every year. And it's not possible to discuss all of them uh, or to, to do a serious deep dive on all of them. Who decides whether a petition is discussed and, and what does that process look like? Any one of the judges can um, have a petition discussed, but what happens, the way they're screened is by central staff. And that's really um, the only way that we can handle the volume of the caseload. So they will do the deep dive initially, a staff member will. And um, so many of them though are screened out because they just don't meet the criteria for a petition. And those criteria are set out in the rules of appellate procedure, I think in rule 66.3. Uh, you know, those are the, you know, is there a conflict among the Court of Appeals? Is there, you know, did they mischaracterize the law? Did they issue a decision that's in conflict with one of ours? I mean, you've got to frame your PDR in those terms to get it before, you know, to really raise its profile, basically. And then uh, a staff attorney will do the memorandum about it, and that goes to the court. We vote on those um, initially, and if, if it gets voted out without anybody asking to discuss it, then it just gets voted out without a discussion. But uh, any judge can ask to have any PDR uh, discussed in conference. Very good. Does anyone have anything else to share on that, describing that process? Yes, Judge Newell. Yeah, I was, I was just saying, like, one of the things I think that we take for granted that we know that may not be obvious to everyone else is that we're meeting every, for conference every Monday, and we're having all of these cases throughout the week that are sent to us, but all the PDRs that are filed, there's a workup by our central staff, but then that, the PDR goes to every one of the judges. There's a copy of the PDR, we go to every one of the judges. So we're, we're in the same thing with the writs and the writ workups. So we're looking at those things and we have a pre-vote system where any one of the, we'll do a vote independently of each other and we'll vote. But if one of us wants to discuss it or see what's going on, that judge can mark it. And that will be discussed the following Monday for conference. So we do this process every week. So we're, it's not a situation where it's like, we're not seeing all these things. It's just, we're seeing them all independently. We're voting on them independently, but occasionally any one of us could say, you know, there's something that doesn't fit me, fit this, or doesn't feel right to me. I want to talk about it with my colleagues. And that's the, the, the great hybrid that Sharon was talking about with PDRs and RITs is that's when we do bring central staff in so that we can actually ask their take on it as well, in addition to what we've, we've seen. Uh, so and, that's- yeah. And I think a lot of people, we've been, um, hit on this, but uh, I think it's a misunderstanding The everything that comes to the court gets lots of sets of eyes on it. So we're not just relying on the staff to tell us what to do because the staff is doing a review and all of us are doing a review and our, and our chamber staff is doing a review. So despite what the media may say about us, we are paying a lot of attention to everything that comes into that court. It happens on a regular basis. Uh, and I mean, I mean a very regular, but multiple times a week sometimes that we have, um, you know, things come before us, PDRs come before the court that, you know, maybe they are uh, recommended to be refused, for example, but judges themselves uh, mark those cases for discussion and come in and talk to the rest of us about why they think maybe that particular case needs more consideration than has been given to it yet. And so um, we're, we're all looking at all the PDRs and we are talking about them in conference when there needs to be discussion about them. Uh, but, but, you know, that you gotta, when you have the number of cases coming into your court the way we do, you, you don't have the time to talk at length about every one of them. And so you've got to have methods and tools at your disposal to try to winnow it down so that you're getting to the ones that really need discussion. 
Very good. And, and I might oh. add, I, I have a pretty open policy in my chambers where any any of my staff members, um, regardless of how central staff has worked up the case, if they have some concerns or they want me to bring it to the attention of the other judges, um, they'll come talk to me about it. We'll look it over. We'll talk about the issues. And um, it's not unusual that those cases eventually make their way into being granted a review or we grant relief on a writ. So there's a lot of eyes that look at these cases. It's not just the nine judges on the court and they come from all different kinds of backgrounds. Well, unless anyone else has something that they'd like to share or a, a burning desire to share something that we haven't covered yet, I will, oh, please Judge I Newell. Feel like, I feel like, no, I'm, I'm sorry to do this, but Judge Slaughter wanted to be here and we and she she wasn't able to be here because she had a personal uh, emergency with getting her children and back and forth. And so she she wanted to express her uh, apologies, sincere apologies for not being able to be here. And and uh, I, I didn't have a chance to fit that in. So I'm sorry to, to sort of put that in, but I wanted to mention that, so. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And this has been such a wonderful evening. Perhaps we can do it again next year. And I'll look forward to Judge Slaughter joining us then. But in the meantime, I just, I'd like to say on behalf of the appellate section, Thank you and introduce my friend Dwight McDonald, who's here from the criminal justice section. Well, good evening and hello everyone. My name is Dwight McDonald, as he told you before, and I am the current chair of the criminal justice section of the State Bar of Texas. And on behalf of the criminal justice section of the State Bar of Texas, I'd like to thank the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals for giving us a behind the look, behind the curtain look at the processes and the procedures that are used in helping them to determine what cases to uh, review and which cases and the decision-making process that they go through. I'd also like to give a special thanks to Jason Boatwright for him spearheading this program and to the Honorable Justice Beth Watkins for her moderation in the program this evening. Uh, and lastly, I'd like to plug the criminal justice section for the State Bar of Texas to let you know that uh, we are the only section in the state bar where criminal defense attorneys, prosecutors, and judges all work together to try and improve the justice system for uh, all of the parties. And so we are always encouraging folks to take a look at and join the criminal justice section of the state bar of Texas. Uh, you can look at our website at www.texastx barcjs.org to get some more information on the criminal justice section. And lastly, but certainly not least, I'd like to thank uh, Judge David Newell for actually including us in tonight's program. With that being said, uh, I know that everybody is trying to get to their next meeting or maybe dinner. Thank you all for your participation this evening. Uh, and on behalf of the criminal justice section of the State Bar of Texas, be safe, stay well. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks Justice Watkins. Thank you, Mr. McDonald and Mr. Bullard. Thank you, Casey. Thank you, Casey. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye.